The Steve Austin Show is brought to you free today by our friends at Bet Online. Get in the mix at betonline.ag and use the promo code PODCAST1 for your 50% welcome bonus. Bet Online, your online sportsbook experts and exclusive partner of Podcast One Sportsnet. The following program is a PodcastOne.com production. From Hollywood, California, by way of the Broken Skull Ranch, this is the Steve Austin Show. Give me a hell yeah. Hell yeah. Now, here's Steve Austin. Vince Russo is my guest today. A lot of people know, the bulk of my audience knows, that I come from the world of pro wrestling. Sometimes I don't talk about wrestling, I talk about all kinds of things. Today, we're going to talk about the Attitude Era. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about Monday Night Raw, some of the things that happened behind the scenes. Uh, whether it was Vince Russo writing or Bruce Pritchard writing, we're just talking about wrestling in general. It's always nice to talk about these things with somebody that was there during the times because, hell, I've forgotten a lot of stuff that I did just because, dude, that was a long time ago. A lot of steel chairs, a lot of damn whiskey and beers, and a lot of time. So when I get a chance to relive some of the memories, it's always a fun time for me. So Vince Russo is my guest. I hope you enjoy the show. It's a lengthy show, so I'm going to keep the open to this podcast very short. Podcast number 500, coming to you from 317 Gimmick Street right here on the mean streets of Los Angeles. But before I get into the podcast with Vince Russo, I got to tell you guys about hymns. Think about this. It's 2018. It's a new year and a chance to make a new impression. And that means keeping your hair in order and becoming the handsomest SOB the world's ever seen. The bottom line is men want to keep their hair and take care of themselves. Now, hassle-free prevention and solutions now exist with hymns. Hems is the wellness brand for the modern man, a one-stop shop for hair loss, skin care, and sexual wellness, making men's personal care trusted, easy, and affordable. Hems offers FDA-approved medical-grade products, personalized recommendations, plus convenient confidential online consultation with a licensed doctor. There ain't no pharmacy lines, no waiting room. The products are shipped directly to your door. And Hems passes big savings along to you, offering prescription and generic for just a fraction of the price. Sound treatment and prevention backed by medicine and science. Look better, feel better, do better with Hems. For listeners of the Steve Austin Show Unleashed, get a trial month of everything you need to keep your hair for just $5 while supplies last. This would cost you hundreds of dollars if you went to a doctor's office or pharmacy. So what are you waiting for? Save some damn money and save your damn hair. Just go to forhims.com forward slash unleash for all the details. That's F O R H I M S dot com forward slash unleashed and stomp a mud hole into hair loss and walk it dry. One more time, that's forhims.com forward slash unleash to get yourself a trial month for just $5. Coming soon to Podcast One, Red Circle Sports with Dennis Miller. Get your weekend sports roundup every Tuesday exclusively from Podcast One and comedian Dennis Miller. He's going through and circling the most exciting headlines so you don't have to and bringing you a lot of laughs along with them. Be sure to download new episodes of Red Circle Sports with Dennis Miller every Tuesday on the Podcast One app, Apple Podcasts, or at PodcastOne.com. This is Steve Austin Unleashed. <laughs> Boy, I tell you what, I'm starting off this, Vince. Just, just FYI, this is my 500th podcast. Oh my God, really, huh, bro? Yeah, this is this is number 500. But the reason I'm saying that to you because to the people that are listening to this podcast right now for the past 10 minutes, I've been trying to get all my audio video adjustments going on my video scope, and I'm trying to get my. Uh, AirPods, this wireless Bluetooth uh, wonder, so I can hear what Vince Russo is saying. So, dude, 500 episodes of this thing I've been doing, and I still have so many discombobulations of headaches, hassles, and horseshit. I still ain't got them figured out, bro. 500 episodes in. How are you? Yeah, but bro, I got to tell you, you're 500 episodes in. You have headphones with no freaking wires, bro. Come on, that that's an advancement in technology. Yeah, but I'm sitting there. I can't. As soon as I put the Bluetooth gimmicks on, I can't hear you. And we're sitting there, and we're looking at each other. I'm like Helen Keller over here. With all due respect to Helen Keller, dude, it's a rib. It's a freaking rib. I, I got you know. I've been doing this uh, every every time I show up somewhere, Vince. I'm a one man posse. I ain't got no entourage. I ain't got no assistants. I ain't got no helpers. I got a producer that I turn my show into that puts the show together. But other than that. 
that. You know, I book my guest. I, you know, I do whatever I do, and then I record. But God dang it, I'm telling you, I, I think I'm going to have to get me some help sooner or later. I just I just can't keep doing it. Yeah, bro, it, it, it's never easy, man, especially with podcasting and technology and the Internet. It, it's always something, bro. I, I'm with you, man. It's always something. But you're still slugging it out. How's your show doing over on Podcast One? My show's doing good, but man, Steve, I got to tell you, I almost lost it because, I, you know, you know, I moved to Indiana for about eight months and Steve, I was living in a log cabin. I was literally living in the woods, bro. I had no internet service, no cable, nothing. And the only way I was able to do my show was through that little AT&T box. I had to use Wi-Fi and man, bro, I was almost out of business there for a while i literally was living in the boondocks well where are you at now you back in colorado i'm back in colorado thank god steve steve eight months in indiana i i, I oh bro i was on the verge of suicide bro What's i swear bad, steve, steve if, bro if i didn't have my catfish that i went back in the lake i fed my catfish every day they came up to the surface they loved me i was over with the catfish Bro, if I didn't have my catfish there, I might have drowned myself in the lake. <laughs> so how, how's the adaptation process been moving back to Colorado? Oh, bro, it's great. I mean, it's great. It, it feels like we uh, it feels like we never left, man. Uh, uh, it just it, it's great to be. I love it here, bro. I, I know you love where you are. I feel the same way about Colorado, bro. I call this God's country. I, I'm supposed to be here, and I just love it, man. Now, where about you at in Denver? I'm about 15 minutes outside of Denver, real close to Denver. Well, I'll tell you what, you know, speaking of Colorado, you know, there's a lot of mountains over there, and I've been, I've got a brother in law over there in Nevada, and he's a guide, so I went hunting with him this year. And then over the Christmas holidays, you know, since I sold my ranch this past year, you know, every year we would go 1,500 miles down to South Texas, and we would stay there for two, we, we'd be there for nine weeks. And dude, it's, it's 55 miles to groceries one way, it's 90 miles to groceries one way if you want to get good groceries into San Antonio. And then just to drive down there, all the headaches, hassles, and the work and I loved it out there I loved it but you know finally it was just time where it was just uh, it was just uh, it was just too much work so we got rid of that place so this year dude we were we went back to Texas to see my folks for Thanksgiving and then for the Christmas holidays we didn't know whether the shit or wind our watch this is the first time I've ever been in LA during the holiday seasons so I mean you know LA's been good to me you know and LA is a great city the weather's phenomenal so I can't complain about that but the, the noise the helicopters the traffic just just the bullshit is just a little too much for me and I, I gotta have an escape valve so we spent about two uh, about a little over two weeks with my brother-in-law down there in nevada and he's about eh, 20 miles out of out of uh, reno and I, I got a chance to ride a lot of four-wheelers and do some stuff outdoors out there so i'm telling you I, i'm looking real hard over in nevada because you know, i think it's you know I, nevada actually has more mountains than colorado but nonetheless my point is you got the mountains over there everything's pretty i don't i don't think nevada is classically as is as pretty as Colorado is, but I've been enjoying that. And dude, just just being able to get out and grab a breath of fresh air and not be surrounded by you know 13 million human beings like here in Los Angeles, dude. I mean, enough Steve, is enough. Steve, you know what it is, bro. It's hard to it's hard for people to really comprehend this unless they've done it, bro. You could be having a miserable day. The day could just suck. You know, dealing with trolls online. You know, what, what, whatever the case may be. But, Steve, here's the thing, bro. When you get in your car, no matter where you go, you see mountains. And there's just something about the tranquility. You know, listen, bro, I don't have to climb them. I don't have to be up in them. I just have to see them. And, Steve, like, listen, I'm, I'm a biblical guy. There's just something with nature and, and peace and tranquility. And, man, I, I wouldn't trade it in for the world. So, bro, you don't have a ranch anymore? You're in L.A. full time? Well, that's why I'm looking. I'm still looking. Yeah, dude, I, I got to have an escape valve. But here's the, here's the thing. I went over to uh, take some trash to the dump for my brother-in-law. And I, on my way to the dump, man, I find a shooting range. I find BLM, which is public land to ride buggies on. So while he's over there working, hell, I loaded up my four-wheeler and started hauling ass, going to all these different places. And 
to your point, like I said, I was there for two weeks, you know, so I wasn't riding four wheelers the entire time I was there, but everywhere I went, you know, there's mountains, there, there's snow on top of the mountains. It hadn't really snowed heavy, so it wasn't on the ground where I was at. But dude, it was just picturesque. And I was like, hey, man, it sure is brown out here because it, it's, you know, obviously everything's dead or it's dormant and it's not quite as green as Colorado can be. But I was like, man, it's kind of brown. But dude, after, after looking at those mountains, every time you get in a vehicle and go somewhere to your point, it's just like, Jesus Christ, it's just friggin' beautiful out here. So, so Steve, what do you do now being in LA and when you, when, when that time comes where you need to get away, what do you do? Well, I've been going back and forth to Nevada, spending time out there. And, uh, you know, I've been looking for a place and, you know, it, the, the, the area that we're looking, it's under 450 miles away. And my ranch was 1500 miles away. So, you know, that drive was just kicking my ass. Oh, God, so yeah, 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 I yeah. think, I think I'm, I think I'm pretty close to finding something. And, you yeah, know, I think that's where I want to be because, uh, you know, also being in California, you got 13% state tax. So I was on top of your federal. So 13% will kick your ass. And uh, it is funny. When, when Phil Mickelson, the famous golfer, was talking about how expensive it was to uh, live in California, everybody crapped all over him. Because I mean, dude's making 40, 50 million years, you know, with endorsements and golf and stuff like that. And everybody's like, oh, dude, shut up. You're making too much money to complain about taxes. Hey, dude, money's money. <laughs> you know, yeah, I, don't, yeah. I don't care how much you make. 13% yeah. is 13%. So anyway, what I like about Nevada is, you know, their their tax laws are similar to Texas. Their gun laws are similar to Texas. I like to hunt. I, a lot of people here here in L.A. are anti-hunting or don't like to hunt. And more power to them. Right. But the, the area that I'm looking at in Nevada, I mean, I, almost everybody hunts. And, and I'm down with that. I mean, so it, without without owning my ranch, you know, I was a high-fenced operation. So, you know, we I had to take X amount of deer every year. Now, like this year in Nevada, I got I got a, I got an opportunity to hunt one buck, and I, I was successful. So I'm done. I have my meat. Well, I've, I've already eaten almost the whole deer by now, <laughs> but I'm able to enjoy it. It's not so yeah. much work, and I'm out there, you know, and, and around like-minded people. So you know, it's yeah, it's a, yeah. It, it's a good place. And Texas got to be so far at 1,500 miles, coming and going. That's 3,000 miles, Oof. dude. It starts. That's that's work. That's work, yeah, dude. bro. That's that is. I mean, yeah, we we were doing that a while when. We were in uh, when we were in Indiana. We were going back and forth to like uh, Atlanta, and then we drive to Florida. And yeah, bro, it's it's just too much travel, man. Where were you living in Atlanta? Uh, Marietta. Yeah, yeah, man. I was over in Dunwood in Roswell when I first came into town working for WCW back in the day. And then I ended up out there in Douglasville on 20 West. I had 10 acres in a log cabin. And man, I loved Atlanta. And I moved out right around 96 when the Olympics happened over there. And, you know, we used to film a show out there in uh, Lake Hartwell. And man, Atlanta blew up. I mean, it's still the jewel of the South. It's still a great city. But holy smokes, man, back in the days in the formative years, I mean, traffic wasn't nothing but a thing. Now, I mean, it's it's such a major city. I mean, it's just like L.A. A big city is a big city. It's like uh, Charlotte. Charlotte used to be a really cool place to go. And then because it just grew so much, it was like, man, when we used to wrestle in Charlotte, I would dread it just because of the traffic. Yeah. Bro, I swear to God, Atlanta, you know, and I was there most recently probably – you know, six months ago, whatever it was. But I mean, bro, literally out an hour outside the city. Now the traffic starts backing up, especially bro with the new stadium. I, they, I mean, it, it, it was hard. No matter, bro. I listen, Steve, I'm going to get you some heat here, bro. I hate Atlanta. I loathe Atlanta, bro. I took such joy. I, I'm not a college football guy, bro. I took such joy in that loss on Monday night. I was jumping up and down like a little kid. I went on Twitter. I was firing away at Twitter. I have so much heat with the state of Georgia right now, bro. It ain't even funny. Well, how long were you down there then? Bro, I was in Atlanta for nine years. So what finally got you out? Well, bro, he, here's what happened. Steve, I went to work for WCW three months in. The gig was up. Three months in, it was freaking over. My kids were young at the time. I didn't want to move them again. So I had to freaking bite the bullet till they grew up a little bit, and I let them live their lives in Atlanta. Bro, I, I loathed it for nine years. Bro, that, then I'm a big baseball fan. And every time I'm going to see the Giants play, you get to see the, oh, 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 
bro. I wanted to kill somebody. I couldn't even go to a baseball game, bro. Yeah, but you 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 were cheering against the Georgia Bulldogs just because. Yeah, oh, bro, bro. When that kid, that lefty kid, bro, he's my he's he's my favorite player in the world right now, bro. Man, I tell you what, well, I'm a huge Alabama fan. I like Georgia too, and I, and I like what Kirby Smart, who was a defense coordinator for Nick Saban, went down there. He's been there two years. He's got that program going. Mark Rick went down there to Miami, but Georgia was kicking Bama's ass. And Jalen Hurts has been, you know, for the last two years, he's been a damn good quarterback. He just challenged trying to throw the ball vertically or deep. And they needed to change up. And finally, they pulled Tua in there, true freshman out of Hawaii. And that kid started throwing the ball downfield. And, I, man, I was just so upset at the calls that Brian Dabble was making. It was like, just, dude, if you know, they were trying to almost like run outside the tackles. I mean, just, just, dude, just run it straight up the gut. No delay. Just hand the ball off. You got Bo Scarborough. You got Damian Harris. Uh, the, the other kid who's escaping my, uh, his name is escaping me right now. They couldn't get uh, Calvin Ridley fired up. And meanwhile, uh, Jake Fromm from Georgia, Dink and Duncan, they started throwing the ball. Uh, Ridley's younger brother was catch Riley Ridley, whatever his name is, a freshman receiver. They were, they were kicking Alabama's ass. And I was like, I don't know if we're going to win this because Alabama's not a team that's built to come from behind with Jalen Hurts as a quarterback. So, dude, I'm sitting there on the edge of my couch and finally they started throwing the ball downfield and I just started I lit up. They threw the interception, and then they kept going. But, oh, dude, it was a hell of a championship game. And and I think, you know, I, I told my wife, I looked over at her, I said, I think that's the most, uh, I think that's the best national championship Nick Saban ever, ever won. And he said there, right then, he goes, I've never been happier. And that reporter said, never. Yeah. He goes, no, never. So I think he was proud of that win. But, man, I tell you what, Jalen Hurts is such a class act and a great kid. It's going to be interesting to see if he's going to transfer or if he's going to come back. And because to me, like you said, lefty Tua has got that job. Yeah, and, and you know what, bro? What what I really like, you know, Steve, I was getting really pissed off during the game. You know, listen, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm 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 looking for reasons to get pissed off at Georgia because I just hate the whole state. So, but what's really pissing me off, Steve, during the game? And I want to get your take on this, man, because I went at it with some people on Twitter. These freaking kids showboating after every single play at that college level and bro don't get me wrong they do the same thing in the nfl but i mean bro i I, steve if you're a if you're i understand emotion i really understand emotion but to me if you're a blue chipper athlete part of that is controlling your emotion and really knowing when to release your emotion and i'll never forget bro there there was a couple of minutes left in the game and i i don't think alabama had tied it yet i think it was 20 to 13 and uh you know the the, uh, the lefty threw a pass and a kid from georgia broke it up and then 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 he stand there on the field like this he's doing all this crap and i'm like brother you're gonna get burned bro you're gonna get freaking burned and sure enough he was the guy burned on the touchdown play but steve like people argue with me oh vin it's emotion it's emotion it's emotion steve i saw some of the freaking greats play okay my favorite football player as a kid growing up was freaking dick butkus okay i i saw butkus i saw terry bradshaw i mean the list franco harris the list goes on and on ken stabler Pros like that didn't showboat back in the day. I understand the motion, but I think you have to channel that. That's why I love the interview with both of those kids when that game was over. Both of those quarterbacks, bro, the way they handled it. uh, I I mean, they came across as role models. I thought it was a beautiful thing. But, Steve, how do you feel about this showboating after every single play on a college level and the NFL level? Well, and, you know, the NFL has got to be a bit much with all the group celebrations and stuff like that and the dancing. And, and they show that rather than when a, an actual fight breaks out. <laughs> and they'll they'll pan away during a fight, but they'll show all the victory celebrations. Dude, I was just, uh, the way we was brought up small town of Edna, it's all about sport, sportsmanship. And so, like, I, you know, going back to when you bring up Dick Butkus, that reminds me of uh, I watched a football life with Earl Campbell. Earl Campbell is mm-hmm. one of my favorite running backs of all time. Where Earl used to play defense. 
defense and then his coach stuck him at running back. He didn't want to play running back. His idol was Dick Butkus. So he became the Dick Butkus who carried the football and punished people. So anyway, when Earl crossed that goal line, he either just dropped the football or tossed it to a ref. Same with my other favorite running back, Barry Sanders. He had done it so many times. I mean, he was just a class act. He just handed the football to the referee. And, and, and that's the kind of guys that these guys were. But I, I'm just not much on the, big, on the celebration stuff. I, I just never have been. As a matter of fact, who was the coach on the sidelines that, that uh, actually touched the referee? It was two weekends ago. God dang, I, I can't remember. Uh, can't remember who it was, but he blew up on the refs, kind of touched on me, and he should have been taken out of the game. But I'm, no, I'm just not much on the celebration. Uh, and that, that's one of the things I like about college football better than NFL is, yeah, there, there was a little bit of celebrating. And the one guy from Bama made that tackle and he shoved it out to, on the dude's head. Uh, it started getting a little chippy, as they say. I'm just not into, you know, yeah. all, all that. And, and, well, you know, the one, the one uh, Georgia linebacker, I think he was a freshman or sophomore, but he had that meltdown on the sidelines, kind of halfway yeah. going under uh, after a coach. And I thought he came back and made a critical tackle on a on a, on a uh, kickoff coverage, but that guy should have been escorted out. I, I don't know, dude. Things are just uh, the game moves faster. I understand emotions, but I'm just not into celebrations to bottom line it. You know, Steve, I was thinking as as I'm watching these kids like carry on and stuff. I God, I, I couldn't help but think, man. You know, I'm I'm a baseball's my game, bro. Could you imagine if when Jackie Robinson came up with the Brooklyn Dodgers? Can you imagine if that guy would have carried himself that way? Oh, it'd have been a whole different story. Oh my, the, the whole landscape of professional sports would have been different if he would have carried himself that way. My, my, my thing is, Steve, and you know, it kind of goes hand in hand with wrestling too, because man, my, my last bro, my last five to seven years at TNA, I saw a drastic change in the athlete. A dra- Bro, I saw this 10 years ago, man. This didn't just happen. And I, I'm always, I'm always, you know, trying to figure out, you know, and, and it's kind of like football. Like how, how did the game change? You know, when, when we look at, let's, let's go to wrestling. This is the wrestling podcast and I'm glad I'm speaking to you. But my God, Steve, you and I grew up in the same era, okay? And 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 to me, there's three triangles to professional wrestling. There there always have been three triangles. There, there's the psychology of the match. There's the two characters in the ring. And there's the storyline that's threading it all together. That's the perfect triangle, bro. I started watching wrestling in 1970. It's been, It was there from 1970 till somewhere around the early 2000s. All of a sudden, here we are in 2018, and if you look at that perfect triangle, none of the sides exist. None. There, there, there's no longer characters. There's no longer stories. And there's very little ring psychology. There's a lot of flip-flop and flying. There's very little ring psychology. And, Steve, I, I, I beat my head against the desk because I'm like, listen, things change in football. Things change in baseball. New, new rules are put into play. In baseball, you know, the designated hitter was a huge, huge rule. They're, they're, they're always trying to speed up the game. But here's the difference. The foundation of those sports never change. The foundation has always been the same. The foundation of professional wrestling is no longer the same. It, it is not professional wrestling now if they want to call it something else like uh you know american lucha or whatever they want to call it i don't have an issue with that but i i keep i keep say i keep trying to figure out it was the same in the 70s the 80s the 90s what the hell made wrestling change so much in the last decade short attention span but you say short attention span steve and that's a great point but steve you know back in the attitude era when we had our matches bro it was crash tv i mean we we were like in and out of everything because we knew back then people had short attention spans so it was like get on to the next thing don't lose them move it move it move it move it when you say short attention span steve Bro, the matches now are going longer than they ever went before. So, I mean, that's where, like, I'm like, well, the attention span does get shorter daily, 
but the matches seem to be going on longer and longer and longer. So you're not a fan of the long match? I'm not, Steve. I'm, I'm, I'm Steve. Can, can I tell you how I look at it? And I think you'll appreciate, bro. We're, we're both huge Rocky fans, right? Oh, absolutely. Okay, now let, 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 let's let's compare Rocky to professional wrestling. If you take all the Rocky movies or, or, or concentrate on one, whatever the case may be, and Steve, all of a sudden we take the characters out of it. We, we take away the character of Rocky Balboa and Apollo Creed. We take away the storyline, this bum from Philadelphia getting a shot. We take that all away, and all of a sudden, all we're seeing is the end of the movie and the boxing match. Are we going to give a rat's ass about that boxing match? Of course we're not. The reason why we care about the match at the end is because of the character and the story, Bill. If you if you strip away the characters and the story, you've got a choreographed fight. And, and, and that's what it is on a weekly basis. And, bro, the casual fans, the, the world that was watching you, bro, they're bye-bye. They're gone. They're the ones with the short attention spans. They they don't want that. They they know it's a choreographed fight. If they're not a wrestling fan, they're not gonna watch. And the W bro, I can't understand why they do, did this. I'll never understand. They have whittled down that audience to a little tiny niche market of these wrestling marks. And bro, every time I cut you every Monday night with that. Yes. chant. you drive me crazy with that. What chant, bro? What, what, what? <laughs> and, and, and Steve, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know how we went from the world to two and a half million people. Somebody needs to explain that to me. Are you saying then that there's not enough work being done to magnify or, or identify the characters? Oh, uh, Steve, they're, they're, it's bad enough that there's no characters, but add to that, no stories. And like I said, at the end of the day, you have long choreographed fights everybody's wrestling because they're mad at each other bro you go back and you look at some of the things with you and taker and kane and the rock steve i'll never forget as long as i live bro do you remember how freaking cold it was and it was after a long day of tv do you remember how cold it was when we were out on that freaking bridge bro with the belt and you threw the belt in the ice, bro. It had to be 50 degrees below freaking zero. I was freezing my nuts off. Okay. <laughs> but that if we didn't do things like that, Steve Austin would have never been who he was. The rock would have never been who he was. And, and it was the constants of doing those things week after week after week that made you guys so iconic. Now it, it's the six man. It's the eight man. It's us. Oh, Steve. And I, I, I get so much heat. But, Steve, I take nothing away from the boys because I think that the work ethic of the boys and the ladies is just the same as it was during the Attitude Era. Those guys work their asses off every Monday night. No, I take nothing away from it. But when you don't give them meat on the bone, why am I watching this? If I want to see a real fight, I will watch UFC. You know, Steve, so many people tell me, and I want to get your take on this. And I say this in the most um, respectful way as possible. And I think you'll know exactly what I'm saying. I get my critics all the time who, who don't – Vince Russo didn't exist during the Attitude Era. I, I had nothing to do with it. I wasn't there. you know. And, and then I'll, I'll, get, I'll get a lot of them saying, well, Vince, of, of, of course you, know, you guys did record, record ratings because look at the roster you guys had. You guys had the greatest rost, wrestling roster of all time. And I would stop and I would say to them, Do you, l listen to what you're saying. You are absolutely correct. We had the greatest roster of all time. But my job was to feed that roster on a weekly basis. And when, when, when I had a character like Steve Austin, I'm writing every single week so his stock is going up and up 
and up, I could not bring down Steve Austin or bring down The Rock or The Taker with what was written. We had to keep topping what we did the week before. And that was the great challenge to me. Steve, I say this all the time. I would have never dreamed of walking into a building and handing Steve Austin a piece of crap. Like, are you free? Like, first of all, you would have you would have looked at me like, bro, what are you kidding me? You would have laughed me out of the building. You were so great. I knew I had to write to that freaking level. And 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 that was the challenge, bro, because you guys were so good. I couldn't phone it in. I was trying to get you from here to here. And that's what people don't understand, man. When you have great talent like a Steve Austin, do you know how easy it is for him to come down the ladder rather than go up? But And what did we have to do, Steve? We had to go to a freaking in bridge at 12 o'clock at night in the freezing cold outside to keep up in the game, up in the game, up in the game. They don't do that today, bro. I, I look at this show today, they're freaking sleepwalking through it. I don't know what's going on creatively. I, I don't want to know, but it comes across like there is just zero, zero effort being put in the creative. The Steve Austin Show. The Steve Austin Show. Check it out, car lovers. Car waxes have really come a long way. Just last year, Meguiar's introduced their hybrid ceramic spray wax. With this bright blue bottle, you can't miss it. Its advanced SiO2 hybrid technology delivers ceramic wax protection and durability far beyond traditional wax. And it's incredibly easy to use. Simply wash your car. Spray on Meguiar's Hybrid Ceramic Spray Wax, then just rinse off for extreme water beating action. No rubbing, no curing, buffing, and the best part, no mess. I'm told the product has been flying off the shelves. And this year, knowing some prefer a more traditional style of application, Meguiar's has launched their liquid version, Meguiar's Hybrid Ceramic Liquid Wax. Long-lasting ceramic protection and an easy-to-use wax. Seals the paint for long-lasting protection against the elements and also delivers the same extreme water beating action. Easy to use, applies just like a traditional liquid wax with no wax residue. Meguiar's also launched a hybrid ceramic spray detailer for in-between boosted maintenance. This removes contaminants like dust, fingerprints, or those pesky bird droppings, boosts gloss, and enhances protection in a flash. And it also contains SiO2 hybrid ceramic protection. Achieve that just wash look by gently removing fresh contaminants between regular washes before they have the chance to bond. Meguiar's has a hybrid ceramic solution for everyone. For incredible water beating, protection, and durability beyond traditional wax, check out Meguiar's. It's ceramic made easy. Meguiar's. This, this is Steve Austin Unleashed. Unleashed. We came here today to talk about 25 years of Monday Night Raw and some of the highlights and stuff like that. So we've talked about college football. We've dese- we've segued into a little bit of baseball and now some of the things that uh, you perceive as being not right with the business. Let's go back to uh, Monday Night Raw a little bit and the fact that it's been on the air for 25 years. When did you first start watching that product? Because I, I think I, when, when did it first start airing? Like 93? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I you know, Steve, I, I was writing. I, I only missed the first couple of shows. I mean, I started um, I started writing for them very not, not not working for them. I was doing the magazine, but I started very, very early on. I, I started working with uh, Raw, you know, before Nitro was on Monday nights, you know. So, I mean, I, I was there very, very early on. I went to some of the early shows before I was even employed by them. So, bro, I no doubt I was there that first year. I mean, I, I was there when, you know, one, two, three kid beat Scott Hall. I mean, I, I was there way back during the day. The atmosphere when I first started uh, that show uh, over the Man- at the Manhattan Center, and it was a great building, and then they started moving it around. Did you think back then that 25 years later that show would still be on the air? 
Oh, I, I mean, no, no. You know, I mean, I mean, first of all, who's thinking 25 years ahead? You know what right. I'm saying? And and Steve, I can sit here and I can bury creative till the cows come home. 25 years every single week. I mean, bro, I don't care what, what heat they're in. <laughs> I tip my hat. I mean, that is that is an unbelievable accomplishment. Uh, it, it says everything you need to know about Vince McMahon. I take nothing away from him. 25 years, bro, is a uh, is a great, great accomplishment. What were some of your favorite moments from Monday Night Raw? Uh, from whether you were there, uh, you know, talent, you know, not including me or just your thoughts in general on, on everything that you remember, because you got a way better memory than me. Steve, I'll tell you the two things that really stick out in my mind, because it, it was it was almost historic. And, and I mean, they, you know, I didn't know it at the time and I would have no idea of knowing it. But when I look back now, I mean, these two moments were were absolutely historic and iconic. And there's one thing I want to clear up and I, I want to get out there. And the stories, the, the stories, uh, you know, are about you and rock. OK, and I, you, I've told you this story to nauseam. I'm going to tell you again, bro, because I love telling the story. OK, I know, Steve, when you came into the WWE and, you know, you, you, you came from ECW. OK, Vince never watched any of that, never watched ECW, never. He didn't know anything about ECW and he knew very little about stunning Steve Austin from WCW. OK, now, Steve, I did not see any of your w, uh, uh, ECW run. I didn't see any of that stuff you did at East. But, bro, I was a huge fan of stunning Steve Austin. I mean, the long blonde hair. I mean, bro, the personality, the charisma was there out the ring. Yin yang. You had to be blind not to see it. So, you know, as the story goes, bro, when when you came in and Vince wasn't real familiar with your uh, what you were capable of, he puts you with Ted DiBiase. You're going to be the ringmaster. And, you know, bro, Vince, every time a new character would come into play, he would call me in his office and he would give me like marching orders on those characters. So we, we get to the ringmaster. And I'll never forget, and I've told you this, he turned to me and he goes, Vince, Steve Austin is to never say a word. DiBiase is to do all his talking. Now, bro, in, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking stunning Steve with that beautiful blonde hair. And I'm like, you know, really, Vince? I'm like, are you sure that's what you want? Yup, that's what we got DBS for. That's what we want. So I remember I had to come and relay that to you. And bro, I tell this to um, I tell this to people all the time. This is where, uh, bro, I'm not saying it because you're here. This is where you were so freaking great. Every week, nonstop, Vince, you gotta find me. You, you, you gotta find me a hole. You got, I gotta get that opportunity. You gotta write some for me to talk. I mean, nonstop, every single week. You were so much on my mind that there was one little tiny spot to put the ringmaster on color commentary. Now, I knew by doing this, DiBiase's not around. It is just Steve Austin on headsets. And I made sure, bro, that I watched that from the back. And Steve, I tell I, I still train young kids today. I'm a I'm a you know I'm a character development coach over here. I tell everybody Steve Austin was given a 90 second to two minute window. And in that freaking window, he became a multimillionaire 10 times over. And I'll never forget, Steve, watching you on the headsets and knowing the psychology, knowing that you knew this was my shot. This was my opportunity. And I remember listening and I was just like, holy shit, like that's it. I, I mean, that's it. And then, you know, from there, I mean, obviously was the explosion, but that that's what I tell people all the time when they complain about TV time or they're not giving me the push. I say push. Steve Austin was given 90 freaking seconds. That's all the guy needed was 90. He said, don't talk to me about a push. So when I go back to that time and I see the the evolution Bro, it, 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 to this day, it gives me goosebumps, man, because what you did with that opportunity, I never saw that again in wrestling. Well, what about The Rock? You said the you had Rock. a good Rock story. You know, Steve, this, is, this, is, this has become controversial over the years, and I didn't find this, I didn't find this out till almost a year ago, okay? Steve, 
I was carrying around with me for a long time. In my head, bro, I just had the name The Rock, The Rock, The Rock. Steve, my right hand to God. I never told Rock. You know why? Who was called The Rock? Who was The Rock? Don Morocco. I didn't want to disrespect Don Morocco. I was a huge Don Morocco fan. He was Don the Rock Morocco. So for the longest time, I was like, I don't know what it was, but I'm like, oh, my God, the Rock, the Rock, the Rock, the Rock. Finally, bro, like it, 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 we were we were at a live show. We were at a live show and I was one on one there with him. We were standing there in the back. And right hand to God, I, I mean, bro, come on. I, why, why would I? If, if I were to make this up, I would sit here and say, yeah, I made up Austin 316. I I, I made up a can of whoop ass. I, like, come on, bro. I, yeah. I, I know who did what. My right hand to God, I said, Rock, I said, do me a favor tonight. He says, what? I said, bro, go out there, cut your promo in the third person. And he looked at me and he goes, what, what do you mean by that? I said, every time you talk, talk to yourself in the third person. The Rock says this. The Rock says that. you know. And he kind of looked at me like, really? And I'm like, yeah, bro, just go out there and give it a shot. J just try it. So sure enough, Steve, I'm in the back. Rock goes out for his promo. It was the Steve Austin moment. I'm sitting there and I'm watching this and I'm saying, holy shit, bro. Like, that's it. Like, I mean, Steve, did I ever know he'd be freaking, uh, you know, applauding Oprah Winfrey at the Golden Globes? No, I didn't know that. But I knew, like, forget it. Like, that's it. You know, he's going to the moon. About two years ago, uh, and also keep in mind, Steve, after my WWE run, like around – my run was over in about 1999. In about 2000, I wrote a book. And all these stories were very, very fresh to my memory when I wrote the book. It just happened. And Steve, you know me, bro. I don't drink. I don't do – I don't my, – my, my mind is clear. I don't do any of that crap where I'm going to forget stuff, especially a, less than a year after the fact. So, bro, like I'm going to be honest with you, and, and I don't mean to throw him under the bus, but it, it really hurt me. Bruce Pritchard you know, does a podcast now. And, uh, you know, bro, I don't know why Bruce decided that he was going to do a podcast about Vince Russo, but he decided to dedicate an entire podcast to Vince Russo. And him and his buddy, they, they had my book and they're going through excerpts of my book. So they come across the excerpt where I tell the rock story that I just told you. And Bruce Pritchett sits there and basically says, you know, Vince is full of shit. That never happened. He made all that up. Jim Ross was the one that gave The Rock the nickname The Rock. Steve, my right hand to God, I never heard that before. I, I, I never heard Jim Ross's involvement or anything like that. But I'm, I'm saying to myself, bro, the, the Rock from Rocky isn't rocket science. So is it is it very possible that Jim Ross and Vince Russo had the idea at the same time? Absolutely. I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, no, Jim Ross never. I have no idea what conversations Jim Ross had with The Rock. None. I know the conversations I had with The Rock. But for, for, for Bruce to sit there and say, I made that all up and it never happened. Well, I mean, bro, OK, if that's the case, then like I said, I came up with Austin 316. I came up with every one of Rock's sayings. I mean, come on, bro. I, I, I know what happened. Bro, every time I talk about you and Rock, I didn't come up with one of those catchphrases. I wish I would have. Bro, I tell the story all the time when you pulled me aside at King of the Ring. Vince, I want to bounce something off you. And you hit me with Austin 316, and I said, I sat there, I said, holy crap, that's it, bro, that's it. I wish I could say I came up with that, but it's it, it, it's those two moments when 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 you guys literally became the two biggest stars, you know, in the history of the business. Th those are really the most memorable. God dang, we had some fun back in the day. Did you ever yep. have anything to do with, uh, and, you know, or, or what was the process when, because uh, I was going through uh, Monday Night Raw on Wikipedia and I was looking at the different songs that were used during the show. <clears throat> And, uh, you know, one of them was Beautiful People. And, dude, I thought that was a hot opening when Marilyn Manson was doing that. And, man, the friggin' 
pyro, the ballyhoo, the explosions of pyro. I mean, dude, it was off the charts. Yeah. Were you ever around any of those discussions, or was that more of a, a KD Vince thing? Production? Yeah, that, I, I had nothing to do with that, bro. And, bro, uh, you know, uh, Jim Johnson, who was just really – what a freaking genius. Are you kidding me, Steve? Are you kidding me? What a genius. I had nothing to do with any of the music or anything. Bro, I'll tell you what was my – I don't, and, and you probably remember this. I'll tell you what was my hardest sell to you. I'll tell you where I thought I was taking the biggest chance with your character. And, bro, I'll tell you what I think to this day was one of the greatest moments in the 25 years of Ryan. We're we're seeing a lot of them on TV now. Bro, I saw the bedpan the other day. Bro, the, see that—that's the thing. Like people say, "Oh, bitch, you—you you take credit for the freaking attitude." Like, are you freaking kidding, bro? The timing of you hitting Vince with that bedpan, it, 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 bro, but you can't write that, bro. You—you you can't write that. And they're playing a lot of the greatest twenty-five moments. But, bro, I gotta tell you, this was—this was a hard sell to you. You weren't a hundred percent on board. You trusted me. I was a little bit afraid. I'm like, oh crap, if this doesn't work. But bro, I watch it back freaking today, and I get goosebumps. And I, I tell you what, bro, I bet you still don't like it. What do you think I'm talking about? And I can't. I have no idea. When you save Stephanie. Remember the, the Undertaker? The Undertaker yeah. had her up on that symbol, bro, yeah. and and they had gone through everybody, and you were the only guy left, and you were the only one that could have done anything. But it was such a hard sell because you had never shown that side of you before. And I remember saying, "Steve, you're a human being," and and it, I can't believe I'm saying this, bro. But at the time, <laughs> Stephanie was an innocent kid. Now she's a monster, bro. Now now she's King Kong time five but i said steve you're a human being she's an innocent kid she's got nothing to do this has nothing to do with vince and and when 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 the people are anticipating nobody's a couple of guys ran in shamrock they got taken out bro nobody was left and like bro nobody knew is he gonna do it or is he not bro when you come out that freaking Pop. I can't even explain it to you. To me, bro, because we saw a side of your character we never saw before. Uh, bro, one, 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 one of the, I thought that was one of the greatest moments in the history. I got to go back and watch that because where was that at? Because we, remember, we did the embalming thing. I ended up on the, the, the symbol, as they would call it. But where was where was Stephanie when I rescued her? She was on the symbol in the middle of the ring. So that, they were, was that when I got hoisted up? No, no, that that was that was a different show. This was okay. in the middle of the ring, bro. We're going off the air. They got her on the symbol. They they're going through the ritual. Guys are trying to trying to run in. They're getting <laughs> picked off. Taker and Paul Bearer are going through the ritual, not missing a beat. With all these guys trying to save her, and then all of a sudden, bro, that glass, bro, Steve, come on. Was there anything in the history of wrestling like that glass? And that that's well, all. Steve, how did it, the glass come about? You tell me. I I don't know that story. Well, I'll tell you, man. Because when I, you know, first of all, I you know, came as a ringmaster. You know that we tell the story. Uh, Ted DiBiase was my manager. I love Ted Ted DiBiase. Great worker, great promo. And I follow him all through his mid south days. So anyway, you know, finally uh, we we'll have the match with Savio Vega, strap match. I'm on my own. You know, I'm sitting at the house. We come up with the Stone Cold Steve Austin. Everybody's already heard that story. So anyway, I, I know that I need a new uh, theme song. So you know. I'm a big, uh, you know, Rage Against the Machine fan. So, you know, I, was, I knew that we were going to be in Stanford. We spent a lot of time in Stanford back in the day. So, you know, I talked to Vince or somebody about getting some new uh, ring music. So, yeah, yeah, I set up a meeting with Jim Johnston. So I go in there and I have a CD. This is back when people had CDs. And I played Jim Johnson, this Rage Against the Machine song, Bulls on Parade. And I said, man, it sounds kind of something like this. And, you know, Jim just a smart, cool, badass guy. And I, got, I had a good relationship with him. I barely, barely talked to him. He felt where I was coming from. So anyway, he takes that song, and you know, all of a sudden, you know, I can't remember, it's a couple of weeks, a month, two, whatever later. And he goes, hey, man, we want to uh, play the song that Jim created for you. And, you know, so I'm just sitting there thinking, I'm, I'm going to hear something that, that's really like Bulls on Parade. It was in that vein, but obviously a completely different vibe. And man, that glass broke. And then all of a sudden that guitar kicked in and then all of a sudden you hear the sirens in the background. I'm like, 
I, I don't know where the glass came from. Jim, pull, Jim, I, I, you, as we would say, pulled it out of his ass. I mean, he pulled it out of his brain because what an, what an ingenious Ugh. way to... And, and it wasn't just glass. It, it's just that hard-hitting glass. If you're invested in the character because it's so dramatic and it's so impactful and because people were invested in the character and I got so over, when that glass freaking broke, it, it was like a, a million pieces or like a million different glasses being broke at the same time and amplified through those speakers. And I just think it was an adrenaline, an instant shot of an adrenaline through the whole crowd, whether you're sitting there in the arena, in the front row, the back row, or watching on your TV set. So, dude, when that glass broke, I mean, it was just amazing. And, and to your point, like, I can barely remember that segment, but all of the times that I went out in dire straits or, uh, you know, when I finally, you know, turned back to the old Stone Cold or there was that big melee in the invasion uh, and everybody was in the ring having this gigantic fight, 20, 25, 30 guys, and all of a sudden here comes that glass breaking. People just shoot off their asses with their hands in the air. Dude, I don't know... To answer your question, I don't know how Jim came up with the glass. I presented the song. I gave him the idea of just a song and a beat. He came up. His genius came up with everything else. And going back to to, to your points about you know guys are are just like wrestling for the sake of wrestling, taking away story, taking away characters. As we go back to the Rocky analogy. You know, we built characters back in those days. You get the, from the bridge stuff, freezing our ass off. Uh, friggin' Mr. Sacco, Mick Foley, Undertaker, The Rock, The Eyebrow, DX, Pure Attitude. If, if I tell you each, each guy, you know who and what they were about, especially that Stone Cold. All of a sudden, man, just this ass kicking, badass, anti authority. And, you know, just a straightforward guy who's, who's championship driven and wants to be the best of the best. And, you know, I had all my idiosyncrasies in all my ways, but yeah, man, I'm getting carried away. So I'm just kind of a uh, frothing at the mouth, spinning about how over everybody was. But anyway, to, to get back to it, just that glass breaking, that was Jim Johnson. And I'll never forget each time that glass broke, just the eruption from those people because they were so invested because, you know, whether, whether it was you or everybody else, coming up with storylines uh, and, you know, the, the rub with Vince or the mix with Vince, the stuff with Brett, the stuff with Rock, the stuff with everybody. Hell, the stuff back in the day when I took the, uh, you know, the color commentary thing when Aldo Montoya was in the ring and I talked about the jock strap on his face. It, it was those nuggets that, that started paving the way and got me over. But God dang, dude, I, started, I just kind of started freelancing there, but it just brings back a lot of memories. And uh, I'll never forget that, that, that one night going back to The Undertaker and it was on a Monday Night Raw. We, we went all over the place for this podcast, but I'll never forget how eerie that was. Because by all practical, intrinsic purposes, that symbol was a cross. <laughs> I could say that now, bro. I couldn't say yeah. it then, but I could. Yes, it was. Yes, it was it a cross. Was. Yes. And so, man, there's there's Stone Cold, and you know, I, I, dude, I'm not trying to be sacrilegious or anything like that or whatever. Austin 316. People always ask me. Still, they send me emails. Hey, man, did did religious people get upset when you came up with that? But it was never intended to be anti-religious or sacrilegious. It was something I came up with. Like I said, I bounced it by you because as soon as Michael Hayes told me that Jake had cut that promo, that popped into my head. But it was so edgy at the time. And dude, you got to go back. This is '95. This is '96. Whatever it was. Was. And it was so edgy. I said, dude, I got to run it by somebody because, you know, th they could be very offensive if taken the wrong way. Remember, you said, dude, you got to do it. You got to do it. I created the rest on the fly. The thing about that, that one angle on, on Monday Night Raw being up on that cross, I remember when we was going through the setup on that. And that was a big, heavy metal iron structure going up on these chains, the cables, all the way to the ceiling of the arena with this hydraulic system. And there was the foot pad where, I, you know, I was going to be standing, you know, they tied my arms like this to the to the side gimmicks and i remember you know i told i told the guys i was looking at the riggers and i said hey man i said is this something that's going to hold up because I, I, I was already looking for an exit as a wrestler you're always looking for a way to fall and i was thinking okay if this thing goes cattywampus or something falls down how am i going to take a bump yeah, yeah. And yeah. so they said, no, nah, man, everything will be good. It's, it'll all be good. So I said, okay, man, I'm cool with it. Sure enough, we'll go out there and we do the business. And I can't even remember all what happened. I just remember that it ended up on the structure. I'm tied to it. My arms are tied to it. I'm standing on the gimmick to keep me up there. And I don't know how many feet I am up in the air. But, dude, 
that arena started getting dark. I mean, because I was past the lights, you know, the cameras were, were shining they were capturing whatever they were capturing. But I'll never forget, dude, it was one of the damnedest out of, you know, we're, we're here to talk about Raw. We segued everywhere in the world, but I don't care. People are just <laughs> listening and having a good time. Dude, that was, uh, that was such a... I hate to use the word surreal. It was so strange standing up there on that platform, and I just kind of just veg. I just kind of, I just kind of relaxed, and just took it all in. And dude, it, it was so eerie, you know. And I, and I don't mean this in a religious connotation or yeah. comparison or nothing. I don't mean anything like that. But dude, it was so friggin' weird. I knew that we'd either crossed a real big line yeah. Yeah. or we yeah. had affected a lot of people or we roped a lot of people into yeah. the angle and by the same token repelled some as well. Yeah. But I knew that it was an effective angle. Well, you, you knew they were going to be talking about it Tuesday morning. That's the key. They were going to be talking about it Tuesday morning. The Steve Austin Show. The Steve Austin Show. Support for the Steve Austin Show comes from our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Home today is so much more than it was yesterday. But at Rocket Mortgage, home is still all about you. During these challenging times, the top priority at Rocket Mortgage is the health and safety of the communities they serve. If you need mortgage assistance, their team is available 24-7 to answer questions and offer solutions. Whether that means saving money on your mortgage or finding a new way to navigate payments, from their home to yours, the team at Rocket Mortgage is with you. Visit rocketmortgage.com slash Austin to learn more. Call for cost information and conditions. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states. NMLS Consumer Access dot org number three zero three zero. Steve, let me ask you this. What was your most memorable moment out of everything you did? Man, I'll tell you what, one of the coolest things we ever did was going over to Flying Brian's house when he had that bad oh, wheel. Yeah. Dude, that we was... pulled that gun angle and I you know, I started busting into his house and you know I got to Brian's house and always knew that he was a big football star. Man, I didn't I didn't know how big a star he was till I got in his basement, saw all of his All America stuff everywhere. Nice grub. I've always gotten along with his wife, and uh, we kind of went through the paces. And me and Brian, we we barely talked. I mean, it was, it was business, you know. And and it was back in the wild wild west kind of in those days. And I showed up and I started doing business with those two guys out in his backyard, throwing the guys in the swimming pool, drowning them, pinning the guy's head in between that jeep, threw the other guy. Into the hit the guy in the head with a wagon, threw the other guy into the garage door, busted that thing to shreds, got that aluminum bat, busted through that window to go in there and get Brian, and he pulled out that damn semi automatic gun. Boom, we went black, and it was like, holy shit. And I knew, dude, I was so full of adrenaline, and you know, and Brian was still in a pretty bad way uh, with his foot and his ankle. And I'll never forget, we, we happened to be crossing paths, both territories. WCW was coming into town. We had just shot in Cincinnati, and we were going out of town. And we were passing through the airport, and a lot of the boys, I mean, this was right during the Monday Night Wars. A lot of us were shaking hands and giving, you know, hey, man, what's up, what's up? A lot of guys were so competitive, we just passed by each other. And a lot of the production staff didn't say shit to me. But it was, that was how competitive it was back in the day. But to, to answer your question, that was, that was uh, out of everything that I did, I mean, God dang, Vince, you know, I had so many great moments. You know, uh, that was one of them because it was so impactful and heavy duty. And a lot of people said we crossed the line and we went too far. Are. Come on, man. Just because it's pro wrestling, we, we pulled a gun, we went too far. So yeah. Why well, always hate? Because there's always a double standard when you watch wrestling these days. You, you don't you don't watch a, an episode of a TV show and say, oh man, the writing's bad. I can't believe, I can't believe, uh, I'll even watch TV, so I can't, you know, can't name characters. Oh man, this, oh, okay, the last show I've ever heard of is, okay, uh, How I Met Your Mother, The Big Bang Theory. I don't even know none of the names and the characters. Uh, so, oh, so and so should have done this. But in wrestling, it's all judged on the writing now rather than the performance. Yeah, so yeah. It, everything has changed. But uh, I thought at that day and age, and that was uh, probably 96, no later than 97. Oh, let, let me get your thoughts. I thought it was a heavy duty, hardcore, great angle. 
Steve, here's where, bro, listen, I, I, Steve, I can't tell you what it is, but a lot of, like, there's a lot of people out there that, like, just want to discredit me. For, for, I, I don't, bro, you got to ask them why it is, because I don't know. I have no problem saying whatsoever. Bro, that's before I was writing. Uh, that, that that definitely Bruce was writing at the time because right. I remember Bruce telling me, Vince, you got to see, you got to see what we're going to do. You got to see what I could do. And I was like, oh, what the, I watched it on TV like everybody else. And I, I, I bro, I had the same reaction. Like yeah, I didn't even know how to react. I didn't because you never saw anything like this before, but that's, that's the difference, you know, Steve, I think, bro, in order to grow anything in, in order to be great, you got to take chances. We didn't do anything safe during the Attitude Era, bro. There, there was nothing safe about it. And, and, and I think in, you know, in, in today's wrestling, I think it's, it's all very safe and we don't want to upset anybody. We got to be political correct. We, and man, I really think that's hurting the business because, man, you've got to take chances, in order to be great. And uh, bro, I, I think it's, I, I mean, that definitely was the first chance without a doubt. Well, I thought, you know, that that's when, you know, I, I really thought we were going to beat them that week in the ratings. Obviously it wasn't a little bit uh, while past that before we started winning the ratings, but it's funny when I start thinking about of all of uh, the Monday night Raws that I was a part of, I know you were a big part of it. Bruce was a big part of it. Bruce and I worked on, on a lot of stuff backstage uh, you and I worked together on a bunch of stuff, but dude, in, in my mind, just like I'm, I'm explaining to you, and I'm looking at you on my on my computer, like whenever that was, like you said, that wasn't you, Ranger. It, so it's it's like I remember you, I remember Bruce, and but I don't remember all of who did this, that, right. or what. But right. just that was an impactful moment. You know, I I loved uh, where, whose idea was the Zamboni. I, I, well, you know, bro, I think that was one of the things, Steve, where something like that you really can't write in because you're not 100 percent sure there's going to be a Zamboni at the building. So that that might have been a thing where we 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 had that in mind. But when we actually got to the building and we saw it. But, bro, I got to tell you something, Steve. Let me tell you what the beauty of that scene was when you go back and watch it. It's not the Zamboni, bro. The beauty of that scene was the way you drove the the same pony. Do you remember, bro? You took out that lighting truss, and oh, yeah. that, that, it, it wasn't scripted that way. That was the whole beauty of that scene because the fact that you took out the lighting trust, it wasn't scripted. That painted the picture of you being reckless. Now you're on a Zamboni. You don't know what the hell you're doing. You don't know who you're going to hurt. You don't know who you're going to kill. It was so out of control. That was the beauty of the scene. Anybody can write, oh, uh, Steve Austin drives in on a Zamboni, but it's how he drives in on the Zamboni. Bro, you talk about you talk about the stars aligning, Steve. I mean, that that's what happened during that time. You know, but there's a lot of times I got lucky because out of all the, the, the motorized or mechanized things I got to drive to the ring, I've always been able to, I think I've I learned how to run that cement truck in about 10 minutes when I filled up Vince's Corvette with cement. And I didn't have a mark on the ground to hit, and I had to fold down all those different things for the cement to flow. I got one chance at that, one chance, and that's all Coliseum. And I, and I got I got lucky and I drilled it with perfection, but I'll never forget it was in Los Angeles, and it was the time I drove the monster limo to the ring. I, I'm hoping this was raw. I'm assuming it was raw, and it was a two wheel drive monster limo, and I had to I was going to jump the car to get to get across with. I don't know they had police cars barricaded or whatever it was, and I looked at the dude who was riding with me. It was his monster limousine. This is before I crushed the rock's car with the monster truck, the 316 truck. And uh, he said, man, when you hit this car, you know, when you hit it, give it a little gas, you know, then you want to jump over it. And uh, he goes, uh, I said, dude, what happens if the axle breaks and we just collapse? He goes, well, you know, then you're going to have to walk in. So it was like, <laughs> man, all of a sudden I get my cue. You know, that's the way we were running back in. I hit that car just right. I friggin' gassed it, boom, jumped it. And, but I was fully prepared. You know, whatever happened was whatever happened. Yeah, and, yeah. uh, you know, another thing, uh, I, well, I'll never forget crushing the rock's car, but I, I'll never forget that night. That, I wonder if that was a raw or smackdown. Do you remember when I crashed the DX bus with the crane? Were you a part of that? I don't remember that. No, I don't. 
Dude, whoever, uh, I went out there and learned how to work a crane. I was just coming back from my neck <laughs> surgery. And I bro, your, 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 your resume was growing during this, bro. Oh, dude, I could have got a control. I could have got a job driving anything. They, they taught me how to uh, work this crane and I pick up this big parking cement structure thing and I'm going to drop it on the bus. Well, they showed me how to move the arm this way and sideways. Well, they didn't tell me that they had tilted it up like that. And I was learning how to, to work it when it was out horizontal. So they did it. They, they put it, they pulled it vertical just to keep it out of everybody's way. Well, when I got in on live TV, well, no, this was done in post, but all of a sudden I start swinging that big parking structure around and you're talking about uh, probably four, ten, four tons of concrete. And that thing starts swinging back towards me, dude. I'm, I'm in a glass cab of that yellow caterpillar uh, crane. And dude, I'm, I'm no selling this thing. I'm about to shit my pants. <laughs> I see that, that, dude, dude, that cement thing I'm swinging points verdict points right towards me and it's headed right towards the glass. And that glass is running straight down six inches in front of my face. And I'm looking and because it's on TV and I think it's just post production, but it was on Monday Night Raw. I, I'm, I'm, I guess we're talking about raw. I'm trying to, but dude, straight up, I'm looking at that cement thing and it's coming straight towards that glass. And in that moment, right there on the spot, I'm stone cold Steve Austin and I ain't selling. So I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> I, I'm going to drop one cuss word on. I'm thinking I'm fixing to die. <laughs> and dude, Vince, I tell you, straight up shoot. <laughs> That cement came this far from oh, that glass. Oh, my God. Literally bro. four inches from that <laughs> glass. And I knew once I swung it out there and it didn't hit, then it wasn't going to swing back and hit further. Yeah. So I knew that I had survived. But, dude, I promise you straight up, I was prepared to die. Can you imagine Steve Austin bailing out the driver's side screaming? <laughs> <laughs> Steve, I got to tell you, one of my favorite things. Bro, and I say, bro, I swear to God, you know, a lot, that, that's why, like, I get pissed off with, 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 with with just a lot of crap that's out there because a lot of what I came up with, it wasn't rocket science. This was one of my favorite moments, Steve. And th I think you can go back. I really think this was the official start of the Attitude Era. Okay. First of all, bro, Vince's, Vince's decision to bring Tyson into the WWE when he was suspended from wrestling for biting of the, was freaking genius and bro who knows what vince spent but that money he spent catapulted the deal that's what i mean about vince being a visionary he saw that it was genius now steve when vince and i you know the very early stages of the attitude era there was a while there when it was just him and i writing like ed wasn't even around yet and like when i was pitching this to vince i was saying vince However, they they went in wrestling 101 over the last 30 years. We got to go the other way. Like when they're expecting us to make a left, make a right. We got to keep doing that across the board because it's going to be unpredictable and it's going to be must see TV. And Steve, this was one of those moments. And I'll tell you, and you'll appreciate this because a lot of times, bro, when we were discussing something and like I was there and Vince was there and, and you know, a Pritchett or a Cornette or a Kevin Dunn, like all the old school guys. I would a lot of times keep my mouth shut and listen to the conversation and, and just just see where they would organically go with something. OK, just sit back, see where they're going with something. And, bro, I'll never forget it. One of the reasons why Vince wanted to bring uh, a Tyson into the WWE. And here's what Vince sold Tyson on. Bro, your PR is a mess right now. You, you, you know, you, you, bro, you, you, come into the WWE. With, and Vince's idea was we'll make you a huge baby face. We're going to put you in a baby face light. We got to help you with the PR. We got to help you get people back on your side. So, Steve, it was one of those meetings and they're sitting there and, and, and they're talking about Mike Tyson's coming in and he's going to stand side by side with Steve Austin. Steve Austin was the huge baby face. And it was it was all presented, Steve, like matter of factly, like we're not even having a conversation here. He's going to be a baby face because I mean, I think it was Hunter, Sean and China at the time. So Tyson would have even the odds. It's a no brainer. Nobody was even thinking 
about Tyson coming in on the side of DX. And they're they're going, matter of fact, they're ready to go on to the next thing. And it was one of those moments where, like, I had to open my mouth. And I had to say, wait a minute, guys. Wait a minute. If freaking Mike Tyson reveals he's with DX, bro, we just threw a giant monkey wrench in the mix. And, you know, Vince's concern was, okay, Vince, that's cool. But when this is all said and done, we got to get Tyson back on that babyface side. That was Vince's biggest concern. And I was like, Vince, we can't pass up this moment. You can't pass down that Tyson and Austin face to face with the D. You can't pass that up. And thank God, bro, like, you know, Vince went with it. We figured out how to get you guys on the same side when all was said and done. But, Steve, I think if you trace everything back – Mike Tyson on that show, on that pay-per-view, I think that was the launching pad to the biggest numbers ever. And we did that by just, you know, boom, he, you know, the, he, he takes off the De- Degeneration X shirt. He's got the 316 shirt. You know, he counts the three count, catches uh, Sean with a quick right. Sean goes down. But but prior to that, in, in that first evening, and I can't remember, was that in Fresno? Oh when God, bro! I'm, te- I'm, I'm terrible with places. I'm well, terrible. Dude, here's the, here's the thing, because you know, I remember Vince running this idea by me, and I was like, man, shit, it'd be great to do business with Mike Tyson, you know. But you know, I was thinking, but because of the legend of Mike Tyson, that Vince thought he was going to come up, come in as the automatic babyface, dude. If you go back and you watch that, and the baddest man on the planet, Iron Mike Tyson, he does the announcement, dude, he's about half heel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now, now I was a baby, but dude, I was a different kind of baby. Right, Very right, edgy. right. And uh, you know, this is obviously he had a suit on. He had his, all of his handlers in there, his, his posse. And man, you know, I hit all four corners because I was going complete disrespect to him. Because dude, here's a boxer and he's in my world now. And so, you know, then we did the face off. You know, a couple of words, the double birds, and then he pushed me. And dude, the cash register started ringing right then. And and Get it. you know, we we needed that. You know, Sean wasn't in the best place he's ever been mentally. His back was busted up. He'd been on a hell of a run, probably underappreciated. And you know, we were fixing to go in, and he was going to drop the belt to me. And this, the, but this was the build up. But dude, w- without Mike Tyson, you know that match it would have been what it would have been. We would we would have traded out that belt. But with Tyson being there, with with all the eyes that he brought with him to to view us and all the mainstream media that he brought to the product, it was just phenomenal. It was a great piece of business, and it, it was fun doing business with Mike. And the thing about uh, doing business with Mike was, I just saw him. Uh, a few months ago at the uh, the Ritz, the Ritz Carlton down half mile from my house here in Marina del Rey, and gave him a big hug. And uh, he was going to, going to do some business somewhere. But uh, that guy's such a historian of the business; he knew more yeah. about the business than half the boys. Yeah, and that's why it was fun to hang around with the guy. I, I think Steve, my theory always was, man. I want to see what you think about this, bro. When Tyson came in, you know, I kind of watched things from a distance, and Vince attached Shane. Like to Mike Tyson's hip. Like, I swear to God, bro, the marching orders had to be wherever Mike Tyson goes, you go. I really believe, bro, at that point in time, Vince was entertaining the idea of managing Mike Tyson's career once he was able to box again. That's what I always thought, bro. And I always thought that's why, you know, he tied Shane. And every time you saw Tyson, you saw Shane. And I really believe there might have been an ulterior motive there for Vince. You know, when, when I mean, bro, the money with Tyson when he came back after the suspension. What, what did you what do you think about that? Man, I would that meant to be pure speculation. I, I didn't see that as all. I, I didn't I I didn't, th- I didn't see that at, at all, but I know Shane was attached to the hip. But they, they made close. for they made for a good tandem, you know. And you know, yeah. Tyson was cheering me on. I mean, he this was before you know that reveal that he was on the side of DX. You know, Stone Cold was allegedly his guy. I, I never got that, but I do remember uh, one time having a brief conversation about God dang Steve. You know, what about a 
you know, you and Tyson in a boxing match. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, I looked at, I looked at Vince and I said, really? <laughs> Vince, Vince tried to convince me that I could go head to head with Mike Tyson in a boxing match. And dude, at, at the time, you know, Jesus Christ, when I was Stone Cold Steve Austin, I was in. I was in 150%. But <laughs> I'd have had to be in 300% on drugs to say yes to have a fight with Mike Tyson. Oh, jeez. Did you remember that ride he caught uh, HBK with right after that match? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, did, 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 the way he pulled that thing, and, and he, he he snugged him a little bit. But, yeah. dude, you know, yeah, you know, Mike Tyson, an untrained professional wrestler in the ring with Mike Tyson for a shoot. I, I, no, you couldn't talk me into it. Steve, I got to ask you something. I've never really talked about this before. And, bro, I guarantee you, you don't have a clue about any of this. Okay? And, and I, 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 I want to tell you about this because, bro, this might have been, like, the most difficult thing that I ever had to do. Bro, when you were going into that big match with Sean, when when you know you were going to take the title, what WrestleMania was that? Fourteen. And he had the back problems. Yep. And you know, bro, he. I mean, Sh- Sean will tell you today that 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 was not the Sean Michael we know today. I, I mean, he'll be the first one to tell you that. I mean, yeah, he wasn't he was, in a good place physically or mentally. Wasn't in a good place. But do you know, Steve? And, and I want to I want to kind of pick your brain about this a little bit. During that whole time, Vince and Sean were not speaking to each other. And Vince assigned me like the middleman where he would deliver a message to Sean. Bro, imagine me, bro, with Sean the state of mind he was in, I'd have to deliver Vince's messages to Sean. Then Sean, in turn, would give me the message. Bro, and I'll never forget. I'll never forget this message. OK, you tell that SOB that if he wants his world heavyweight title, it'll be on my mantle on my fireplace in San Antonio. Tell that SOB to come to my house and get it himself. And bro, I had to go back and say, uh, Vince, uh, Sean said, blah, blah, blah. But how difficult was that for you, Steve, or? Was that totally a Sean and Vince thing and and Sean dealt with you as a professional or did you pick up some of the, you know, fringe heat during that time? Well, it was very interesting because I was white hot and we needed that belt to just culminate an exclamation point three times the fact, hey man, yeah, this dude's been hot and this is the, this is the symbol. This is the stamp. And that, that's when a belt really does mean something. You can trade belts around as much as you want, but when you do it at the right time for the right reason, it means everything. So I was the guy. And, I, you know, as Sean said, I don't think he would have dropped that belt to anybody else in the company. And, and he wasn't in a good place. So for me, you know, I was just kind of like, I knew I was on fire. I knew I was hot. I'd been in the business eight or nine years. I was, I knew what, what time it was. I could go in the ring. I could have a good match. I could cut a promo. And now, but now you've got a guy who could work his ass off, what had been a, a top guy for a long time. And he wasn't, you know, he, he was, he was injured. He was just, he was just, he was just burnt. And I, many of us has been in the same places. I've oh, been yeah. in Sean's shoes a couple of times myself. Yeah, I knew where he was. So it was just, it was just, a, for, for me, it was just, uh, hey man, hopefully this match comes off. Hopefully he's going to the ring. You know, he's, he was going to do the right thing, you know, once the bell rung. Yes, and the yes. match was not a classic. But no, it was a deal like, you know, he was willing to do the thing where we did, we did the, uh, the kind of, the, whatever the walkthrough was there at the, outdoor thing where you know i got tied up in the ropes and sean yeah. and mike planted a kiss on me for a photo op to further you know promote that match right so right. you know he was late coming out of his limo and you know he was in a bad mood but he did the business you know it was just a, it, he was just in a bad place but it, it but you're asking me what i felt so i just felt like you know sean was was being difficult you know hunter was his buddy still are great friends and he was also kind of a buffer a little bit. 
And dude, I was just kind of, I was doing exactly, you know, I was, I was where I needed to be, but I was in my own zone. And yeah. so it just, it, it, it all ended up working out. It all ended up happening. The match was, man, it was not a classic by any stretch of the imagination. So I just, I weathered the storm and I was like, man, we'll get through this. And I'll, I'll never forget this because, uh, you know, Shawn Michaels is to me the best in-ring performer I've ever seen. I'll never forget after that match, you know, it, it popped the bell in pretty good. Not as good as I would have liked to. Tyson did the quick three count. And then, uh, you know, we, we walk around, we celebrate, and then we go to the back. And I remember because, you know, me and, me and Vince were starting to get kind of close because, you know, the higher you up on that ladder, the more money you're drawing, the closer you are to the to the old man, to Vince. And, you know, we had become, you know, I don't mean like buddy, buddy. I mean, business partners. Yeah. yeah and yeah, so, yeah. And, and that's when you start learning, hey, what's going on in between his ears uh, on, on a higher level, a very high level. And I look straight at Vince. And uh, I said, God damn, I said, that wasn't very good. And he goes, don't worry about it. Tomorrow on Monday night, we'll be off and running. Yeah. And that's how we that's how we started. We got out of 14, but it was just a process of, of, of weathering, you know, through the storm that Sean was going through, getting through it. But I was just a byproduct. As, as Sean was a little obstinate, let's say, yeah. very. And, and a lot of people, there's a story of Taker wrapping up his fist with the tape. There's that story. You know, I don't know about that. You'd have to get that from Taker. But Sean was going to do the thing, and he did, and here we are. Steve, here's the question like that I always like, you know, obviously I'm not a wrestler. I'm not a performer. I don't know that high, especially, bro, I don't know that high in front of a WrestleMania crowd. But I'll never forget, bro, because the whole lead into that match was the back problem Sean was having. And, you know, I mean, bro, he was in agony and his back hurt. And, and bro, I'll never forget it. You've got to remember this. I was watching that match like everybody else. And I was literally concerned about Sean's health because of his back. And I remember watching that match, uh, uh, Steve. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of the match, Sean does a kip up. And I remember I saw that and half of me was like, you SOB. But the other half was, OK, bro, let's let's write that off to an adrenaline rush. It's WrestleMania. It's in the heat of the moment. The guy ain't feeling a thing. But, bro, with, with what I went through leading up to that and seeing that kip up to this day, I put a big question mark at the end of that sentence. Dude, pure speculation, valid, valid question. <laughs> Dude, I do not know. I think he did end up having back surgery or whatever, but I mean, he, he was beat to shreds. Yeah, His back yeah. was hurt. And, and Shawn Michaels is, is, is such a performer. Dude, oh. he, he could have he could have literally been paralyzed and he could have kept up because he is Mr. WrestleMania and he's, he's that god dang good. So you know, good point. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not gonna call him out on yeah. it. I, 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 I rarely talk to Sean, but I'm very good friends with him. But I yeah, don't, oh I don't no, know he's he's the best. I mean, um, there'll never be another guy like him, bro. I don't Just think so. he could do it all. Steve, was there ever a disappointment for you? Like, were you ever really disappointed in some? Did did something not? quite work out the way you wanted it to well yeah i mean well that match didn't work out like i wanted it to because you know i I'd, you gotta understand when i came to the company in late 95 96 man i was i was uh working main events well first of all i started off while working with savio vega you know and he got me in shape and uh then i was working with brett and sean so you know i was i was getting kicked in the mouth or i was tapping out in the sharpshooter every single night they beating the shit out of me and that was fun because i'm working with top guys and i could go but you know once we got to the ring in 14 because i'd already worked with Sean and call matches with Sean and I knew we could light it up. Yeah, uh, th things didn't go the way I would have liked them to on that night. Yeah. So, yeah. But, and, and dude, there's, there, I mean, more specifically, I mean, I can't remember, you know, well, there's a take, take the match I had with Undertaker at a Highway to Hell in, in Madison yeah. Square Garden in New York City. You know, uh, he bent down for a backdrop. I kicked him. He straightened out. The back of his head caught me under the chin, knocked me out. You know, I'm sitting there laying on the mat, and uh, Earl Hebner standing over me. He looks down at me. He goes, "God damn boy, you all right?" And I said, "Where am I?" He goes, "God damn it, boy, you in the garden." So, <laughs> and, uh, so then from from that point on, the mat stuck. You can see me going through the motions, but I don't know where I'm at or what I'm doing. Yeah. I remember laying on that announcer's desk 
and Taker is up on the top turnbuckle and he's going to drop a leg on me. And I'm laying there and I'm thinking, I'm, I'm back in it now. But I mean, I still, the match wasn't very good because I'd been knocked out. And I'm, I'm laying there on that damn announce table and Taker is 6'11 and he's 320 pounds. And dude, when he's standing on that top pipe of that turnbuckle, it is a long way up and he's looking down at me. And boy, I just kind of, I looked in his eyes and I figured, well, we talked about it. It looks like he's coming. And sure, <laughs> that big son of a bitch dropped that leg on me and the table busted. I, I'm just rambling about the match, but it was awesome. And you're just laying there as you lay there on that table. I mean, this is back before we were really good gimmicking up tables right, and right. it wasn't really old school but I, I, I don't think it was ever gimmicked at all and when he came crashing down and that's just one of them cases where dude your hope and everything you, you didn't practice this because there's no way you can practice right. it it's like right. hey this sounds like a cool thing to do you want to try it yeah and yeah. we did so yeah Man, the one thing about Taker, bro, that stands out to me, and again, I had the privilege to be in the back, and Steve, like, you can vouch for this, bro, I can't tell you how many times I would witness a a, a, a Taker 10-star match, bro, no, no matter who he was in the ring with, a 10-star match, and then, bro, he would come in the back, he would try to go off to a secluded place where nobody could see him, he would be laid out in freaking agony. You know, the the back, the back pain, bro. And and I would look at him and I, I would be like, how did you just do that? Like you would have not known that you, you would have thought the guy was a 22 year old kid in that ring. And then when he went to the back and you could see, you know, the pain and the wear, I, man, I, I gained so much respect for him seeing that on a daily basis, bro. That guy played hurt a lot. The Steve Austin Show. The Steve Austin Show. Did you know that right now Geico is offering an extra 15% credit on car, motorcycle, and RV policies? That's 15% on top of the money Geico can already save you. So what are you waiting for? Your dog to make your breakfast in bed? With Belgian waffles and a fresh food compote? As nice as that sounds, that's probably never going to happen. But at least there's never been a better time to switch to Geico. Save an extra 15% when you switch by October 7th. Visit Geico.com to learn more. Here's the thing, uh, before we wrap it up, and I want to get uh, people to find you on social media and talk about your show, but here's the thing about Taker. You know, I, I bowed out in around 2003, give or take. You know, I, I had my last match with The Rock at 19. We did some co-general manager stuff. I don't even know exactly when I rode into the sunset, but at that time, in, in 2003, dude, and this is 15 years ago as we just turned into 2018, we were kidding each other because I think Undertaker might be six to ten months younger than I am, but he's been in the business about a year and a half or two years longer than I have. And we were just kind of kidding each other as these grizzled vets back in the day. You know, which one of us is going to last longer? Right, and, of course, right. Jesus Christ, dude, I faded off in the sunset with a bum neck. And this guy, well, up until last year or however long it's been, I mean, dude, he got 14 more years out of that carcass he's trapped in. So I got nothing but the utmost respect for the guy. Yeah, it's like it's free. It's almost free. It's borderline freaky. It really is, bro. I mean, because the things he did for a guy that size for that many years. I mean, my God, bro. And that's what I tell people. I tell people it's like, hey, man, being, being you know, six feet to six, three, you know, that's kind of the or, or you know whatever. And I think that's that's a great size to be at because you're doing kind of normal stuff as you get longer kinesiology physiology changes and the bumps affect you in a more drastic way quick case before we ride off hulk hogan dropping that leg every single night for how many years he dropped that leg dude you drop that leg so many times you're gonna blow a hip out and, you know, and he has. I mean, it's like, dude, there was times, you know, people ask me this all the time. Hey, man, over the course of being on the road, was there ever any case, you know, where you were instructed to give the stunner but didn't want to because of injury? And there were. There were, there were several times when you jack up your lower back and everything gets all jammed up down there. Dude, when you jump up and down and, you know, land on your ass for a living, that's a good living to make. Yeah. But then, <laughs> I'll never forget, I gave Bill Goldberg. I love Goldberg. Bill is about 290. I gave him a stone cold stunner and he kind of went horizontal 
And dude, most time guys go down to their knees or like, you know, Scott Halls and stuff would stay on, stay on their feet, but most guys go to their knees. So their pressure is rarely you know, even felt on my shoulder. Goldberg comes down kind of halfway horizontally. And so he didn't really use his knees. So he basically crushes me like an accordion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, what just happened? I just give this guy my finishing move and it almost finished me. So there was a lot of times where, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd show up at the building because you're always waiting to show up on Monday night and see what you're doing. Hey, man, we got this for you. And I, boy, all of a sudden, I'm stunning the whole damn company. You know, it doesn't matter, you know, if your back's out, your back's good. You know, if, if you're giving if you're giving your finish to everybody, you're giving your finish to everybody. It doesn't matter <laughs> right. what the hell you feel like. Right, right. Steve, I got to ask you one last question. Go for it. All right. Just between me and you and these four walls, nobody's listening. Now, were you a Francois guy or would you not allow the guy to come within a mile radius of you? Dude. <laughs> oh, that's, that's a great story. Francois uh, used to do. He used to be kind of this uh, Shih Tzu massage. I, shot, I can't even pronounce the word massage guy. And he was based out of Los Angeles. And like he, he was kind of like a self-taught chiropractor. He went to school or stuff like that. Like, you know, when we came through town or to Los Angeles, you know, he would work on all the boys. He'd go to backstage on the West Coast, and there'd be Francois with his kit or, you know, his, his massage board or whatever, cracking necks and doing rubs and stuff like that. So I'll never forget, man, I had injured my neck. And then uh, Francois calls up Vince. You know, he had a French accent. He goes, I can fix him. I can fix him. I can him. fix. I can fix. I can fix. <laughs> <But> dude, <laughs> I was living in San Antonio, Texas. I flew out to Los Angeles, and I was out here for three days. Well, actually, it was two and a half. And so the two and a half days that Francois worked on me had these fingers that were like oh. lightning. They were like like steel bolts. <laughs> and dude, he, he, Vince could see me on my computer screen. He's pushing these fingers into my friggin' neck. And it feels like it's about to come out my throat. And, you know, two and a half days, I'm over getting tortured by this guy. I'm thinking, what the? Are you, are you, are you friggin' ribbing me? <laughs> and he was climbing the wall, though, too, at the oh, same yeah. time, right? The feet were up on the wall. <laughs> you know the whole gimmick. Yeah, yeah, You yeah, know yeah. the tricks you saw. But anyway, after two and a half days of that, I was like... First of all, dude, you cannot fix the problem that I had with massage. I'm, I'm not going dis to discount the guy and say that he didn't help a lot of the boys. He was great at massage and some manipulation. But when you, when you have spinal stenosis and you have a bone spur growing into your spinal cord and due to an injury, you have a bruised spinal cord. Uh, from impact, you cannot fix that with your hands. You need <laughs> you need a blade. You're going to go in there and you're cleaning shit out. Oh, uh, bro, Mick, Mick swore by him. Swore by him, Mick. Oh, no, no, no. Like I said, I give yeah. him credit for being yeah. able to manipulate, you know, put things back in place. But for the type of injury that oh, I yeah. had, that's when, that's when you're Steve, like. Steve, I got to tell you. Dude, real, I tried real, it, dude. I tried it. Yeah. I got to tell you real quickly my favorite Francois story. I, I mean, Steve, I, to this day, if you're a gimmick, I, I'm your biggest fan. Francois was a walking, talking gimmick because, bro, you forgot a whole a whole part. It's not only was he a massage therapist, chiropractor, uh, a, a faith healer, whatever the hell, but also, bro, there were stories he fought in the Foreign Legion. He killed 100 men by himself. There were all these freaking stories. He was like Walter freaking Mitty. But, bro, listen, hold on. Hold the phone there. Bro, the guy had a freaking gorgeous wife. His wife was a freaking model. Francois, uh, uh, Steve, I, st I, I was such a fan of his. I literally stayed at his house for a weekend. First of all, bro, you know what he had as a pet? Bro, he had this four-foot freaking iguana walking around the house. Four foot, bro. Four yeah. foot. Four foot. Bro, he had some kind of sports car, Steve. I, it was like just made for him. It was like a $100,000 car, right? So, Steve, one day I'm with him in, in L.A., bro, and, uh, you know, we're going down the streets of L.A. He's in this $100,000 sports car, right? He, we come to a stoplight, bro, and he comes neck to neck with another freaking expensive sports car, right, bro? All of a sudden, the guy to the left starts revving the freaking gas, and now Francois, oh, you want to go? You want to go? They, they both got their windows. Everybody's got the tinted windows in L.A. Oh, you want to go? Bro, the light turns green, Francois floors it, 
bro, these two guys through the streets of L.A. Bro, remember Steve McQueen bullet, the cars going up and down? Bro, I'm crapping my pants, Steve. I'm like, Francois, what are you doing? Oh, he want to race me. He's going to race me. He want to race me. So, bro, through the streets of L.A. like bullet, I swear to God, Steve, we come to a stoplight. Okay, they both stop at the stoplight. Francois is on the right. He he rolls down his uh, his driver's side window. The guy on the left rolls down the passenger side window. Bro, guess who it is? Who? Warren Beatty, bro. Warren <laughs> freaking Beatty. And bro, bro, I'm I'm so freaking starstruck. I'm like freaking Francois. It's freaking Warren Beatty. Bro, he was like, I don't care. I don't give a damn. Warren Beatty wanted to race me. Well, he ra- I, bro, he didn't even sell it was freaking Warren Beatty. Oh, jeez. Uh, you know, I saw his, his ex-wife. I don't know if they got married what. Leslie, I saw her. saw her in Marina Del Rey. Uh, that's what that's where I, we live, Marina yeah, Del Rey. Yeah, that's I, saw, I saw her about three years ago, and I, I was at his apartment. I saw the iguana. He was climbing the walls, working on me. <laughs> my last, my, speaking, speaking about go fast or here's my last story. I can't remember what town we're at. It was somewhere close to Cincinnati because flying Brian Pillman had brought his car to the, to the building and it was a 911 Porsche 911 and I can't remember what color it was it was naturally aspirated and he goes kid come on let's go for a ride so I'm thinking dude I don't let anybody in the business drive me if you're not a good driver you can't drive DDP I won't let him drive <laughs> Mick Foley I love Mick Foley won't let him drive he's a great uh, passenger but I gotta drive Billy Gunn I'll let him drive Kevin Nash, I'll let him drive. You got to be a real good driver for me to get in the car with you. So here we go. We're getting flying Brian's Porsche 911. I'm thinking, okay, we're just going a little leisurely ride because we're in the city. Dude, all of a sudden, we get out on a freaking highway, and he just starts <laughs> ripping through the gears. And that car, and he's got some kind of unbelievable exhaust. Yay! 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 And, dude, and, I, and I, you know, you know, you're doing the thing where you're kind of grabbing your side bolsters here, <laughs> and you're putting your brakes on over there in your bay. <laughs> I'm doing that, and yeah. I don't know how fast we're going, but I'll never forget it. I'm trying to just bring to mind and make him co- conscious or cognizant of the fact that we're hauling ass and I'm very uncomfortable. <laughs> so I kind of look at him. I, I'm, I'm going to put him over, but kind of get him a, get him to know how fast we're going. I said, dude, I said, how fast are we going? And this is when I knew we were in trouble and we were going to go faster. He looks over at me and he goes, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> Vince, I swear to God, I almost reached over and turned the key off and turned on the friggin' ignition. I thought we were going to die in, in a Porsche 911, and Brian was hauling friggin' ass. And it's safe to say you never let him drive again. Never. Never. <laughs> it's, it's like when I, when I jump, I got, I got a guy, who's a friend of mine over in uh, Los Angeles, he always brings these badass sports cars by. And, you know, I'll, I'll tell him right up. I said, hey, dude, you know, if you want to give this thing a little bit of gas, it's cool, but... I don't play that shit. <laughs> but, hey, man, uh, it was good catching up with you. Oh, we were yeah, going to talk about 25 always. years of Raw. We talked about nothing, but uh, I had a good time talking to you. Tell people how they can find your show and tell people where you're at in social media. Yeah, I am on Podcast One, the great Podcast One. We're doing a show now six days a week on Podcast One, believe it or not. And you can catch the video version of the shows on the Realm Network, R-E-L-M Network. And I'm I'm just the Twitter guy, so you can you can follow me at the Vince Russo. Hey, we gotta start. <laughs> we gotta catch up more often. Yeah, it's always fun. This has been a Podcast One production. Download new episodes of the Steve Austin Show every Tuesday at PodcastOne.com. That's PodcastOne.com. Coming to Live by Live Thursday, July 30th, Darius Rucker's Darius and Friends Virtual Concert, benefiting St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Catch an exclusive one-time-only performance by Darius Rucker live from the Grand Ole Opry stage, featuring guest appearances by Clint Black and Tracy Lawrence. All proceeds from the show benefit St. Jude, so get your tickets today at LiveXLive.com slash Darius, and tune in July 30th at 8 p.m. Eastern, only on Live by Live.